the last presentation. Um, I wanted to talk about a patient that I saw in a Dr. Bernstein's clinic when I was a second year, a year and a half ago. Uh, and this is really one of the uh, uh, best patient encounters I've had in residency. So I'll always remember this case. So this is a 16-year-old male with a history of a high myopia, was referred to Dr. Bernstein's clinic uh, for a workup of RP. So his mom says that since he was a kid, he kept on running into things uh, in the dark, and he really did, didn't like playing outside when it gets uh, dark. It's part of the you know, RP questions. You, know, you ask whether he could see the stars, and he said he, he, really, um, uh, he really couldn't. Uh, so for the last several years, he was told that he likely has retinitis uh, pigmentosa and that his vision will get worse. Um, but he says he, uh, his vision's been stable for the last several years. He can see well in school um, and actually does well in school, but he was instituted um, low vision training, including braille and mobility for the last several years. So he was learning how to braille, how to cane. After classes, he would go to um, you know extra classes, like uh, the letters were projected to him in like big fonts. And he, he, he told me that he really didn't think he had any problem seeing the letters and he was just seeing fine. Uh, so otherwise pretty healthy kid. He did have a history of a right orbital blowout fracture three years ago uh, that did not require any surgeries. Uh, he has a, a high myopia with minus 16 in the right and minus 17 on the left, wears contact lenses, and he has a history of exotropia uh, and uh, uh, stratus post trabismus surgery. His family history is very interesting. He has a maternal male first degree cousin that was diagnosed with uh, RP at the age of three or four. And this is actually the son of his mother's identical mm. twin sister. Um, the patient has uh, four siblings and uh, none have vision problems. Uh, I don't know uh, the history of, uh, this, uh, of this cousin that he has. So his examination in, uh, in clinic, uh, his visual acuity was 20-30 in both eyes, with pinholes of 20-20. The anterior segment ex examination was unremarkable. Dilated fundus examination shows a tilted and myopic uh, optic disc, and uh, there's a mild pigment uh, mottling in the macula. There's these dots that you can see in the mid-periphery that's just artifact uh, from the camera that you would usually see in high myopes. I talked to Jim about it this and learned uh, as well. Uh, but uh, just to point out, there uh, are no bone spicules that's characteristic of a retinitis pigmentosa. The vessel seems normal. Uh, macula OCT was normal, just, uh, and the uh, Goldman visual fields were full in both eyes. So as part of the workup, we did full field ERGs, and just, um, you know, I think we're all, uh, we've seen uh, the, this printout, and I just wanted to review a couple of things. Um, and just to remind everyone the conditions that Dr. Creel uses. So uh, the first five, one, two, three, four, five, are done under scotopic conditions. So the patient is uh, dark adapted for 20, 30 minutes, and then um, there's a dim blue flash, and then records ERG, and then there's a dim red flash, and records, records ERG, a dim white light, a bright white light, and then the oscillatory potentials are, uh, are measured as well. Um, and then the patient is uh, light adapted for at least five minutes. And then you have the photopic ERG measurements, which is the single white flash. Um, and then you record the ERG from it. And then of course the 30 Hertz flicker for cone function. Um, uh, so th these are all very important to look at, but I'd like to draw your attention to the scotopic condition, uh, the bright white flash. And uh, uh, what we can see is that the A waves um, uh, are normal. Uh, but the B waves is highly attenuated. Uh, it's about 81 microvolts in the right eye and uh, 91 microvolts in the left eye. At, you know, this should be around 500. So the B waves are highly attenuated. Um, so, uh, and this suggests that there's abnormality in the bipolar cells. So the differential diagnosis right away with this is uh, uh, on top is congenital sta stationary night blindness retinitis pigmentosa, rod cone dystrophy, vitamin A deficiency, and especially for the residents and for us to review, um, uh, it, what you call when the B waves is gone and what you're left is just a, uh, a wave is an electronegative ERG. Uh, and the differential diagnosis for this is very small, including CSNB or congenital stationary night blindness, melanoma associated retinopathy, X-linked juvenile retinoschisis and CRAO and CRVO. Uh, these are mostly tested for boards. 
So, C so we think that this patient has CSNB. So this is a non-progressive disease. X-linked is the most common, which you know likely explains that his cousin likely also has a, a X-linked uh, congenital, uh, congenital stationary night blindness. But it's also been reported to be inherited autosomal recessive and autosomal dominant. Uh, this, uh, this is a, a, a rare class of diseases, and we do, do not know um, its prevalence, but we do know that it's been reported in all uh, in all races or all racial backgrounds. Visual acuity uh, could be highly variable from being a very, very good visual acuity to 2020 to not very good at 2200. And uh, uh, the important associations include high myopia, nystagmus, and strabismus. Again, our patient has you know, very high myopia and uh, strabismus. So you know, one of the main points I'd like to point out today is that CSNB is a genetically and phenotypically heterogeneous group of diseases. This is not one disease. And you can classify this as uh, types with normal fundus appearance and abnormal fundus appearance. In the normal fundus appearance, um, we have the Riggs and Schubert-Bornstein uh, types. And with the fundus, abnormal fundus appearance, we have fundus albipunctatus and Oguchi disease. And these are also part of the differential diagnosis as well. Uh, and these uh, all carry uh, the, uh, the classic electronegative ERG response, except one of them. So the, the question that we have is, you know, uh, how can we distinguish the types, especially in our patient? Uh, and, and this is mostly an academic exercise. And, uh, and really, it's ERGs. So in the Schubert-Bornstein, we know that it's the, what's hit is bi our bipolar cells. And we see the electronegative scotopic ERG, again, the normal A wave with a decreased uh, B wave that's shown in here. And you know, uh, sir, you know, this is a really flat B wave. Our patients still had like a little bit. The RIGs, uh, we know that the mutation is uh, mostly uh, uh, have problems with photoreceptors. Uh, and so the, um, the ERG uh, shows basically absence of the A wave, but have a robust B wave response. And this is all scotopic conditions. Uh, and to make it a little bit more complicated, CSNB is associated with 17 genes now. And these are all the genes that I found um, uh, in the literature. And they, the proteins uh, that encode are uh, localizes to either the RPE rods and uh, bipolar cells. Uh, in X-link, which is the most common um, uh, uh, inheritance pattern, there's only two genes associated. And it's a NIX and the CACNA. 1F, and they're both uh, localized to bipolar cells. So NIX encodes a protein, nictalopin. We don't know its function, but we know that it's involved in transmission of signal from photoreceptors to on bipolar cells. Uh, this is uh, associated, we know that, that it's associated with a complete form of CSNB, which I'll talk about in the next slide. Um, but this has a preserved cone function. The CACNA 1F is, uh, uh, encodes a voltage gate and calcium channel subunit, and it's associated in contrast to NICS, the incomplete form, and uh, both rods and cone signaling are both affected. You know, we're, we're always tested on this, and it's always a little bit confusing, but just to orient, you know, especially for the resident, complete CSNB, at least um, uh, historically, has been defined electrophysiologically. So in scotopic conditions, you see complete CSNB, it's complete absence of both A and B wave. In the incomplete form, we still have the B wave. And that's, you know, the terminology matches. But um, when you look at um, uh, the cones in the complete CSNB, the rods are basically abolished, or rod signaling to bipolar are, are abolished, but the cones are not. So you still see a 30 hertz flicker. Compared to the incomplete CSNB, um, where both cones and rod signaling are affected. So it's a little confusing, the terminology. So the question is, how about our patient? So it's scotopic condition, you know, it's pretty flat, um, uh, consistent with complete CSNB. In photopic conditions, we do see that, you know, a, a small B wave, again, consistent with the CSNB. In the 30 hertz flicker, we have a normal cone response. So we think that this is a complete uh, form of a CSNB. Uh, likely associated with NICS. Unfortunately, we do not have the genetic um, uh, test to confirm this yet as of now. So just to, uh, just to finish up my talk, uh, I just want to show you pretty pictures of the types of CSNB with abnormal fundus appearance. The first one is a, a fundus albipunctatus, which you see this, you know, lots of yellow um, in the periphery. Uh, this is associated with RDH5 mutation, and uh, some uh, just important uh, facts to highlight are just it's involved in, uh, or the pathophysiology involves delayed regeneration of rhodopsin, 
and that the rod, you know, the ERG is abnormal, but it can normalize with extended dark adaptation to hours or even days. Uh, and lastly, Oguchi disease. This is a, a recent GRK mutation, mostly found in Japanese. And what you can see is this, uh, this is a paper with a five-year-old kid with this like uh, gold yellow sheen of the fundus. Uh, she was dark adapted overnight, basically kept in the dark and then took a picture of her fundus and you know, it normalized. And after 30 minutes of a uh, uh, light adaptation, uh, the fundus goes back again. We do not know the mechanism, uh, but this is called the Mitsuo Nakamura phenomenon. So in summary, CSNB is a non-progressive retinal dystrophy that mostly affects males. The Schubert-Bornstein type has a normal fundus with characteristic electronegative ERG. NYX is associated with complete CSNB, and the CACNA1F is incomplete CSNB, are both uh, associated with X-linked. And full-field ERG is important diagnosis of CSNB um, in the workup of retinal dystroph dystrophies. So back to the patient, we ordered a genetic panel, which is not back yet. And uh, you know the, the conversation I had uh, with this patient, telling him that he's that his disease is non-progressive, he's not going blind, and he doesn't really have to do braille or caning. The, the parents just just incredible. Like you know, the, the, uh, his uh, life plan dramatically changed after that conversation. So um, you know, pretty awesome feeling uh, to tell somebody that he's not going blind. Um, so thank you. Any questions?